We're going to have Paul Wilkinson come, and uh, Paul is a graduate of University of Manchester. He, he also has a degree for, in math from some British university I don't remember. York. Ooh. York. Whoops. There we go. Let, York. No? <laughs> York. That's probably where New York comes from, don't you reckon? <laughs> New York City, uh, get a rope, you know? Okay, uh, and he is going to talk about the role that the rapture plays in evangelism. And he's uh, on staff at... Um, Hazel Grove for Gospel Church. Yes, I never can remember that. Of course... In Stockport, just outside Manchester. In Stockport... I do remember that, which is near Manchester. It's a suburb of Manchester, England. And uh, I've been there, and I, I, I heard that they're not gonna let, allow me to come back. <laughs> but we always like to have Paul back and have him talk about the role of the rapture and evangelism. I've seen parts of this presentation before, and it's just excellent the way he weaves in uh, some historical events and how even uh, some of the people we characterize as some of the worst people in the world struggled with the issue of the gospel. And uh, that's the way, you know, that's kind of the way we meet people every day. In fact, I would argue, at least in my lifetime, that the rapture is one of the leading doctrines that you can uh, talk about to introduce people to Jesus Christ. How many of y'all, by the way, came to faith in Christ through, uh, you know, Lake Great Planet Earth or uh, Bible prophecy in some way or another? Raise your hand. Okay, it looks like about maybe 20% of the room. And I remember when I was in seminary at Dallas in the uh, mid-70s, that there were a lot of people there who had gotten saved through like their planet Earth and were now entering seminary to train for the ministry and things. And so I, I believe that Bible prophecy, the rapture, and these events are often a, an excellent way to get a person's attention to preach the gospel. And of course, some of y'all like to just preach the gospel straight out. That's fine. But others uh, often couple it with uh, Bible prophecy. So, Paul, come on and uh, do your thing. Well, good afternoon to you all. It is uh, wonderful to be back in, in Texas. And uh, I bring greetings from my church, as always, Hazel Grove for Gospel Church. And as I shared in the introductions this morning, it's... Uh, a conference of many blessings for me personally and for us as a church. To be here is a joy and a blessing, but to be here with my pastor, Andrew Robinson's son, Samuel, makes it um, a very special occasion for, for all of us. And um, I do pray that the Lord will meet with each one of us throughout this uh, special time, of, not just of teaching, but of fellowship that we enjoy in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we just come and settle our hearts in your presence. We come to worship and adore you, our great God and creator, and the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, without whom we would have no hope. O oh Lord, we just want to bless you through the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts, and that you will meet with us and we with you during this time together. And Lord, as our good shepherd, I pray that you would touch the lives of your flock that have assembled for this conference at this time. Lord, we love you, we need you, and we are looking and longing for your appearing. Even today, Lord, if that be your will, we would say, come Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. In 1879, a former Baptist minister called Edward Dennett from Britain wrote a book called The Blessed Hope. Edward Dennett was a Baptist, and for a time he wrote against the brethren, the Plymouth Brethren. He had lots of uh, problems with uh, brethren teaching until 
he was persuaded and joined their ranks. And he wrote this beautiful book, The Blessed Hope. And this is how the book begins. As it is becoming every day more manifest that we are in the midst of perilous times, it behoves the Lord's people to be increasingly occupied with the expectation of his return. It is now nearly 50 years since the cry was raised, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And he's referring back to the late 1820s and to the rise of Plymouth Brethrenism, to the, the days of John Nelson Darby and those that the Lord raised up to proclaim this wonderful message, this glorious message of our Lord's any moment return. He went on. Up till that time, the church had fallen into profound slumber, drugged by the opiate influences of the world, so that the doctrine of the Lord's return for his saints was forgotten, ignored, or denied. But when, through the action of the Spirit of God, this cry went forth, thousands were startled from their sleep, and, trimming their lamps, went forth once again to meet the bridegroom. For a season, they lived in the daily hope of his return, and so mightily did this hope act upon their hearts and lives that it detached them from everything, every association, habit, and practice unsuitable to him for whom they waited, and kept, their, kept them with their loins girt and their lights burning as those who were waiting for their Lord. But time went on, and while the doctrine of the second advent has been apprehended and taught by increasing numbers, it is yet a question if large numbers of the saints of God have not lost its freshness and power. If this be so, the time has come when the truth on this subject needs to be pressed home again upon the hearts and consciences of believers. These words are as relevant today as they were back in 18. 79. Well, in 1992, as you know, uh, Dr. Tim LaHaye, burdened by the way many of his ministerial friends had turned away from the pre-tribulation position, he wrote this book, No Fear of the Storm, that was republished as Rapture Under Attack. And in that book, Dr. Le Dr. LaHaye said this, historically, Belief in the any moment coming of Christ produces an evangelistic church of soul winning Christians. For when we believe Christ could appear at any moment, we seek to share him with our friends, lest they be left behind at his coming. And so for the first part of this presentation, I want to look at something of the historical aspect to what Dr. LaHaye, Dr. LaHaye was referring to here. And so we're going to consider a few of that great cloud of witnesses, those brethren in Christ whom the Lord raised up during earlier generations to proclaim the message of his return. And I want to take you back to 16th and 17th century England and just to flag up some of the very well-known and esteemed bishops and Puritan scholars, theologians, pastors, who were not necessarily talking about a pre-tribulation rapture in the way that we have come to understand it, but very much had their hearts and minds set upon the Lord Jesus and upon his return. And as you know, the 16th and 17th centuries were very formative, very, a very fluid time as uh, these men that we're going to look at were grappling with eschatology. It certainly wasn't clear in their writings, um, and that's not the purpose of this presentation. The purpose is really just to, to say that God has always had his witnesses, men who have loved the Lord Jesus, men who have sacrificed their lives, even to the point of death, men who were passionate for the souls of the lost, men whose heart were very much touched by the Spirit of God, and they didn't have all their doctrine correct. But what they did have was a, was a heart that was in touch with their beloved Savior. And I want to begin with William Tyndale, that wonderful man of God that the Lord raised up in the early part of the 16th century, the man whom the Lord used to bring the Bible into the language of the common man, into modern English. 
And what a sacrifice he paid to bring us the scriptures. He produced the, the first modern English New Testament in English in 1526. And for his efforts, for his desire to bring the word of God into the hands of the common people, the common plowmen, he was arrested by the church, as you know, and he was executed. He was garroted and then burnt at the stake. But this is what William Tyndale said in 1570. Well, this is quoted uh, in a volume in 1573. Obviously, he said it many years previous. In his exposition upon the first epistle of St. John. Another thing is this. All the scripture maketh mention of the res resurrection and coming again of Christ. And we are commanded to look every hour for that day to look every hour for the coming of our Lord. Was he a pre-tribulationist? No, I don't think so. But certainly he had his heart set upon the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bishop Hugh Latimer, very well respected and esteemed within the Church of England. And in a sermon that he preached on the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, in 1552, he said this, St. Paul to the Thessalonians, when he speaketh of the resurrection of the good, saith that at the same day the trumpet shall blow, and all shall rise which died since the world began. Then they that shall be found alive upon the earth shall be changed suddenly, and shall be wrapped up into the air, and so meet Christ our Saviour. I would have you to note well the manner of speaking which St. Paul useth. He speaketh like as if the last day should have been come in his time. Now when St. Paul thought that this day should have been come in his time, how much more shall we think that it shall be in our time? For no doubt he will come, and it is not long there unto. Now many of these men that we're looking at uh, believe that the coming of the Lord would be the end, the end of the world. They didn't necessarily speak about a tribulation period. Many of them didn't believe in a millennium. Many of them were amillennial. But these were men who walked with God. These were men that studied the Word of God. And these were men that were persecuted for doing just that. And you may know the name Hugh Latimer in connection with his close friend, his brother in Christ, another bishop, Nicholas Ridley. Because in 1555, these two men were burnt at the stake in Oxford, England. And if you've ever visited Oxford, I'm sure you've been to the spot where they were put to death. Put to death because they wouldn't bow the knee to Rome. Put to death because they would not compromise their faith in Jesus Christ. Put to death because they would not bow the knee to the Pope. They would not adhere to the doctrines of purgatory and so on and so forth. And as the flames began to light around their feet, this is what Bishop Hugh Latimer said. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. And the Lord has lit a candle. When we think of the doctrine of his return, it is a candle that continues to burn bright. And no matter what man may do, no matter what the enemy may do, no matter what the principalities and powers may do, that candle cannot be extinguished. Because it is a candle that has been set alight by the Lord himself. I don't know if any of you have a copy of uh, the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was very much the, the Bible of the common Christian man in the uh, second half of the 16th century and into the, the 17th century. Up until King James I had it outlawed. He didn't like it. He didn't like a Bible that had marginal notes. But the 1560 Geneva Bible had a great impact upon Christians. It was the Bible of William Shakespeare. It was the Bible of John Milton. And it was the Bible of the Pilgrim Fathers, in particular the 1599 edition that came over to, um, to this country. 
And I just want to make mention from a copy of the 1599 Geneva Bible, which my pastor Andrew Robinson uh, showed me. He's a, an avid collector of old Bibles and Puritan works, sermons, books of common prayer. And uh, it's very interesting what the marginal note says to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, which it has translated in this particular version as, We which live and are remaining in the coming of the Lord. This is what the marginal note says to the 1599 Geneva Bible. This was the Bible of increased mother, as Dr. Rice mentioned his name uh, a little earlier on. Whoever wrote these notes, I cannot remember, said this. He speaketh, the Apostle Paul speaketh of these things as though he should be one of them whom the Lord shall find alive at his coming. Because that time is uncertain and therefore every one of us ought to be in such a readiness as if the Lord were coming at every moment. This is 1599. The Geneva Bible. Richard Sibbs, that name may not mean a great deal to many. There are his dates, 1577 to 1635. Richard Sibbs was a Puritan theologian. He was nicknamed the Christ Preacher, which is just a wonderful term because he preached Jesus. His focus was just preaching Christ and him crucified. And his works were widely read in New England. Uh, men like John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon uh, greatly esteemed the works of Richard Sibbs. And in his sermon from 1638, entitled The Church's Echo, in one sermon, he said this, All the desires of the church are restless till the consummation of all things in the latter coming of Christ. In another sermon that year, entitled The Bride's Longing for Her Bridegroom's Second Coming, he said this, the Holy Apostle, the Apostle Paul, had no greater a conjuration or a solemn appeal to move Timothy to be diligent and to quicken him in his ministry than by the coming of our Lord Jesus. So let us stir up ourselves and comfort ourselves hereby. The doctrine of our Lord's return was the great motivation factor that the Apostle Paul wanted to convey to his son in the faith, Timothy, that would encourage him as a pastor and as an evangelist and the, the entire ministry that the Lord had been pleased to give to Timothy. The coming of the Lord. Again, they were not pre-tribulational in the, in the sense that we've come to understand. They didn't connect the rapture with the tribulation period, at least not in the writings that I've read. And I've only looked at a few sermons and a few extracts from their books. Richard Baxter, a very godly pastor, famous for his book, The Saints Everlasting Rest, first published in 1650. He wrote this book during a time of tremendous physical suffering and hardship. And his entire focus was on heaven, upon our heavenly rest, upon that which our Lord has prepared for his saints. And he wanted to convey that hope, that comfort to the flock of Christ that was entrusted to his care. And again, my pastor, a, a, a man who very much loves Richard Baxter, and uh, he opened up his works to me some time ago. And this is one extract from that work. Whenever the apostles would quicken to duty, and we're thinking especially in this presentation of evangelism, of witnessing for Jesus, whenever the apostles would quicken to duty or comfort and encourage to patient waiting, they usually do it by mentioning Christ's coming. Why then do we not use more this cordial consideration whenever we want support and comfort? And so the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 18 says, encourage one another with these words. Comfort, strengthen one another with these words. When you're facing persecution, when you're facing trial, get the focus on the Lord Jesus and his promise that he will come for you. That he has gone to prepare that precious and glorious place for each one of us in his Father's house. Richard Baxter, a Puritan pastor, a poet, hymn writer, 
and a leading nonconformist of his generation. And then there's Bishop Joseph Hall, there are his dates, 1574 to 1656. A bishop, a satirist, and two works I'm quoting from here, The Rapture of Elijah and also The Ascension. And in The Rapture of Elijah, very interesting, just that title itself, The Rapture of Elijah, that's how he saw the taking up in those chariots of fire of uh, the great prophet, that's how he described it, as a rapture, used the noun rapture to describe Elijah's ascension. Many, he said, shall have their share in his Elijah's loss. He must be missed on the sudden. It will happen very suddenly. It was meet, therefore, that the world should know that his rapture should be divine and glorious. God had already spoken to the prophets, the school of prophets, to Elisha, that Elijah was going to depart. And then he goes on to say, and God will not work wonders without witnesses. And in his work on the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, referring to Acts chapter 1, he said this, Elias had but one witness of his rapture into heaven, he's referring to Elisha, St. Paul had none, and thou, O blessed Je Jesu, wouldst neither have all eyes witnesses of thine ascension, nor yet too few. In other words, the whole world wasn't going to witness the ascension, the rapture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting that he connects the ascension of our Lord with the rapture of Elijah and the rapture of St. Paul? Because Jesus sets the example, he sets the pattern, he sets the type. He's the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. He's also the one who was taken up first, caught up. And the Greek word there isn't harpazo as it is in 1 Thessalonians 4, but nevertheless, even there, back in the, um, the 1600s, a bishop in the Church of England was talking of the ascension of our Lord as a rapture. And so it is, although our rapture will not be witnessed publicly by the entire world, God has proclaimed a witness. We are witnesses. The Word of God is a witness to the coming rapture of the church, which shall be di divine, which shall be glorious, though the world will not see it. There are witnesses and have always been witnesses through the ages to that event and that is our calling isn't it to tell people at any moment Jesus is going to come and take his bride the true church out of here into glory well let's move forward into the 18th century and a couple of the greatest evangelists that this world has ever known George Whitfield very well known in my home country and traveled widely throughout the colonies, a Calvinist, but, well, there's no but. How the Lord greatly used this man of God. That was a slip, forgive me. There was no... <laughs> but many, many, many people came to faith in Jesus Christ through the ministry of this man. And you know about his association with John and Charles Wesley. They were part of that holy club from which Methodism was born at Oxford University. And for a time, George Whitfield separated from John Wesley, but they remained um, friends uh, through the, the, the common heart and love that they had for the Lord and for his people and for the lost. And how God just burned in their hearts that desire to, to just to get out of the churches, to get out away from the institutions and into the open air, to the coal pits, to the, to the cemeteries, into the, into the fields, to the meadows, to speak about Jesus. And in 1739, in a sermon entitled The Wise and Foolish Virgins, George Whitfield said this, let that cry, behold the bridegroom cometh, be continually sounding in your ears and begin now to live as though you were assured this night that you were to go forth to meet him. I don't know what George Whitfield's eschatology was, but I know one thing just from this sermon, his eyes were on the Lord Jesus 
And he had that expectation and desire that the Lord would come at any moment. And he wanted to, to instill that into the church. Well, I mentioned John Wesley. An Anglican until the day he went to glory. And yet he was the founder of Methodism. And uh, he was very much the one that, that took over the mantle in, in Great Britain from George Whitfield to, to preach the gospel. And he was hunted and hounded by the religious authorities of that time. He was stoned, even in Manchester, my home city, for preaching Jesus Christ. And he said in his sermon, The Righteousness of Faith in 1742, Perhaps, and he's preaching the gospel on this occasion, perhaps he will appear as the day spring from on high before the morning light. Oh, do not set him a time. Expect him every hour. Now he is nigh, even at the door. You see that the imminence of our Lord's return was burning bright in the hearts of these men. Whatever their eschatology was, it's not clear. I believe he was premillennial, but what he understood about the rapture of the church, I haven't um, read enough to make any conclusion about that. But his eyes were on Jesus. And because of that burn, that burning candle in his heart, because he knew Jesus could come at any moment, because he knew he had been called with a, a very special calling to get out there into the world and reach the lost, there was an urgency. There was an urgency about his ministry that was driving him to tell as many of the lost about Jesus, the Savior, the only hope. Well, we move on into the 19th century. And as we know, that's the time, that's the century when the pre-tribulation rapture of the church as a doctrine becomes systematized. It becomes clarified in the thinking of many believers. And we're going to hear more during this conference of uh, one man in particular, who I'm going to mention in a moment. But here is a, a photograph taken many years ago of Powerscourt House in Dublin, in the south of Ireland. And I had the privilege during the summer of uh, visiting Powerscourt again with uh, Dr. Ice and Janice when they were touring the UK. And um, Powerscourt was the scene of those prophecy, Bible prophecy conferences in the early 1800s, early 1830s, which really put the any moment pre-tribulation rapture of the church on the map. And the man that the Lord really raised up at that time was John Nelson Darby. And this is what he said in a, a Bible reading in the town of Rochdale in England, just a few minutes drive from my home, a reading on the book of Colossians chapter 1, he said this, A man may not know much about the rapture of the church and yet be waiting for someone to come and take him out of this scene. And that's why I introduced men like Tyndale and Sibbs and Bishop Hall because they had that expectation. They knew Jesus was coming. They were longing for his, his Excuse me, they were longing for his appearing. But they didn't have a doctrine set out clearly in their, in their mind. Before ever I knew about the Lord's coming, Darby said, I think I loved his appearing. I knew nothing about the doctrine, but the principle of loving his appearing was in my mind, though I could not define it. In a Bible reading on the book of Numbers, he said this, People accept the Lord's coming as a doctrine that he will appear, but not as coming at any moment to take up the church. The doctrine of the second coming of the Lord Jesus has been held by the church for 2,000 years. It's there in the early creeds. But not as an imminent expectation. And so when John Nelson Darby became convinced, then that urgency began to to quicken within his heart. And he went on to say on this occasion, I remember when brethren, the Plymouth brethren, were very much exercised about the truth of the rapture, specifically the timing of the rapture. And it is a truth that will sift Christians amazingly. And I'm sure we can all bear testimony to the truth of that. The doctrine of the rapture of the church sifts 
Christians. It divides Christians, the body of Christ. It should not do that, but it does for whatever reason. Well, in a private letter that Darby wrote on the 23rd of January, 1862, he said this, in connection with what you tell me about evangelization, it is a joy to me when God gives me the grace of being occupied with that part of the work. In these last times, this work is of the greatest importance. And that's what the doctrine of the rapture, the understanding of our Lord's any moment return, did to Derby and the early brethren. It got them out there into the world, onto the streets, wherever they could get an audience to tell people that time was short, that Jesus was coming back, that now was the day of salvation, that they could not put off that decision that they needed to make for God. James H. Brooks, and now I'm just going to mention a, a few men that the Lord has raised up to, to herald our Lord's return. Names that you will have studied, whose writings you will have studied, I'm sure. James H. Brooks, who was that much-loved pastor of Walnut Street Presbyterian Church in St. Louis. Really the founding father, or one of the founding fathers of American pre-tribulationism. And uh, the main leader of the, the Niagara Bible conference movement in the, the latter part of the 19th century, the man that mentored Cyrus Schofield. And in his book, Maranatha, or The Lord Cometh, first published in 1874, Brooks said this, the doctrine of Christ's return is precisely the truth that braces the nerves of missionary enterprise and animates the ambassadors of Christ to constant diligence. William E. Blackstone, the Chicago businessman turned clergyman that many Jewish Zionists have described as the father of Zionism because of the heart that he had for the Jewish people, because of the understanding, understanding that he had of God's everlasting purposes for the nation of Israel. The man who founded the Chicago Hebrew Mission in 1887, and the one that really um, drew up what became known as the Blackstone Memorial in 1891, when the Jewish people in Russia were being persecuted during the pogroms, he drew up a petition that was signed by over 400 clergymen and Jewish leaders, businessmen like John D. Rockefeller, and that memorial was presented to the then US President um, Harrison, Benjamin Harrison, appealing to the American president to use his influence to encourage the powers of Europe to convene a conference that would consider the plight of the Jews, and not only that, but to encourage these powers to help the Jewish people come back to their ancient homeland, the land that was at that time known as Palestine, the land of Israel. And that memorial came to nothing in 1891. It was represented to um, President Woodrow Wilson in 1917. And uh, Woodrow Wilson was very much behind this memorial and uh, it was Woodrow Wilson that gave his approval to the Balfour Declaration that was so important then in November 1917. William Blackstone, 1878, produces this 90-page pamphlet that was then developed in subsequent, subsequent years called Jesus is Coming. It was a pre-millennial bestseller of that time, translated in over 40 languages. And uh, for all the plaudits that have been given to William Blackstone, he just described himself as God's little errand boy. On an errand for the Lord, which is all that we are at the end of the day. We're just on an errand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And William Blackstone said this, Surely no doctrine in the Word of God presents a deeper motive for crucifying the flesh and for separation unto God and to work for souls than this does the doctrine of our Lord's any moment return. These men didn't just write books about prophecy. They didn't just speak at conferences about prophecy and the coming of the Lord. These men applied that doctrine. That doctrine 
motivated their entire life and ministry. G. Campbell Morgan, a Congregationalist uh, from my country, an evangelist, a scholar, described as the Prince of Expositors. I mentioned a couple of years ago about G. Campbell Morgan and uh, the crossings, 54 crossings he made from the UK to the United States. He was much loved here in the US and uh, ministered here for many years. And he, he met and was admired by Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, a close friend of D.L. Moody and the author of one of the essays in the Fundamentals that were published in 1915. Well, in 1912, he wrote this book, Sunrise, Behold, He Cometh, in which he said this, to wait for the sun from heaven is to be driven out. Not just to be driven into your study or driven into the libraries or driven onto the internet, but to be driven out there to the lost world with a passion to serve and save them that are without. Reuben A. Torrey, pastor, evangelist, author, again, worked closely with D.L. Moody and another great evangelist, Charles Alexander, in their evangelistic campaigns around the world, became the superintendent of Moody Bible Institute and the pastor of Moody Bible Church and the dean of Biola University in Los Angeles. In his book, The Return of the Lord Jesus, 1913, Torrey said this, Our Lord Jesus is coming. You can almost hear the passion as he writes those words. How these words should make us eager to bring our friends to Christ at once, lest they be left at his coming. Reading men like Torrey and Blackstone and Darby has a convicting influence, certainly in my life, because I know I'm not doing enough. I know I'm not as urgent as I need to be. I know that I'm not out there as much as I should be telling people about the Savior while there is yet time. Amzie Clarence Dixon, what a joy it was to read his biography. Born near Shelby in North Carolina, described as an indefatigable pastor, evangelist, missionary, and author. Became the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago and later of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, Charles Spurgeon's church in London. And in a letter that he wrote in 1917 to a, a public gathering in London that launched, effectively launched what became known as the Prophetic Witness Movement International, which I serve with today, this is what Dixon said, it is certain that we ought to be expecting his return for his people at any moment. It is certain that this blessed hope of the Lord's return for us at any moment makes us not mystical dreamers, but faithful servants. And here's a quote from Dixon in David Larson's book, The Company of the Preachers. How I do long to preach Jesus to the lost and to see them saved. These men were pastors, they were Bible teachers, scholars, authors, but they were desirous to be out there to tell the lost about Jesus. They understood God's grace in their own lives and that compelled them, motivated them. The doctrine of the Lord's return motivated, stirred, inspired, drove them out to preach Jesus while there was yet time. And F.B. Mayer the founder of Prophetic Witness Movement International was the one-time president of the Baptist Union and the World Sunday School Association, much loved here in the United States. Again, very close friend of D.L. Moody and, and many of these uh, early dispensationalists here in America. This is what he had to say in the Advent Testimony Manifesto that was published in the UK in 1917. The return of our Lord may be expected at any moment the pressing duty of the church is to exercise her witnessing function. Well, these men walk with the Lord Jesus. And we know from the Gospels that our Lord's ministry was characterized by that urgency. He knew his time was short. His rapture, if you like, was imminent. And he was driven out by this desire to seek and save the lost, first and foremost, the lost of the 
the, the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And nothing would stop him. No one would stop him going to the outcasts, to the sinners, the prostitutes, the unclean, to bring them the message of God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness. But the message that the kingdom of God was at hand and that they could not put off any longer that decision to draw near to God and get their lives right with God. And Jesus came to set people free from that yoke of bondage, not just to sin, but to the, the religious traditions that had built, been built up over generations. Our Lord's entire ministry was characterized by compassion. Compassion that was missing in the, from the hearts of the Pharisees and the scribes and the, the chief priests of, of his day. And the compassion of God that, was, that is missing from many leaders in the church of our time. Matthew 9:36, one of several passages we could quote. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And that's how God the Father, that's how the Son during his earthly ministry looked upon the people that he was sent to. They were like sheep wandering, scattered, lame, malnourished, neglected. No one was bringing them hope. No one was bringing them comfort. No one was bringing them good news. And that's what Jesus did. He went to bring the good news to those who had ears to hear. And many did hear that message. Hallelujah. Well, I'm in good company and you could teach me about this amazing word that's used in scriptures like the one we just mentioned. Forgive me if I don't pronounce this right. Splanknitsomai. Isn't that a beautiful word? <laughs> if you just read that, you'd probably pass it by and, and look for something more inspiring and um, easy on the ear and on the eye. But splanknitsomai, what a word this is. Because it means to be moved as to one's bowels. To be moved in the most innermost part of your being. And to have that deep inner yearning to act on someone else's behalf. And that's what Jesus had. That's what the Pharisees did not have. That's what the religious leaders of our Lord's day did not have. That deep inner yearning for the lost. That compassion. The number of times we read how Jesus sighed when he saw the people and the condition that they were in. But the compassion drove Jesus to speak and proclaim a glorious message that would set people free and bring them hope. And that's what our Lord called his apostles to do. And that's what the Lord has called the church of every generation to do. To be filled with his compassion. I don't have enough compassion. I know that. And I'm sure some of you would feel the same. But we need through the Holy Spirit more of our Lord's compassion so that we will care about those in our families, those in our workplace, those in our colleges and universities, those on the streets that are facing a lost eternity. Jesus was moved to do something about it. And we who have been privileged to receive this glorious message of our Lord's any moment in return, well, we are without excuse, aren't we? I am without excuse. I know Jesus could come back today. Therefore, I should be out there telling people while there is yet time. And of course, that urgency in our Lord's ministry, John 9 verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Well, you may not be familiar with this gentleman, Arthur Skevington Wood. Arthur Skevington Wood was the principal of a Theological College in the north of England, again not far from my home fellowship, Hazel Grove for Gospel Church. It's called Cliff College. It was founded in 1883 by a man called Henry Grattan Guinness, a historicist. Premillennial, but a historicist. But the emphasis of that college was on mission and evangelism. And when Skevington Wood became the principal, he was a futurist. He believed in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, unlike uh, Grattan Guinness. 
And that was the emphasis that was placed upon the students that came into his college. That in the light of our Lord's imminent appearing as Christians, we needed to get out there and witness for Jesus. And in his book published in 1964 called Prophecy in the Space Age, Skevington Wood just summarized what we've just been looking at. He said this, again, we can find value in this teaching about the second advent because it adds urgency to evangelism. This was the effect of the belief in the early days of Christianity when the church was very young. It gave punch to the missionary proclamation. It provided a stimulus to the evangelistic task of the church. Those first Christians were vividly aware of the second coming. It was their concern to sweep as many into the gospel net as they could before the end. And so we read the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 verse 40, and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from the wrath of God that is to come. And many were cut to the heart, weren't they, at the message that Peter proclaimed. What must we do to be saved and we've got to tell people what they must do to be saved from the wrath that is coming upon this earth and the Apostle Paul in 1st Timothy chapter 2 said this very familiar passage first of all then I urge that supplications prayers intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people not all kinds of people but all people because God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him would not perish and so the Apostle Paul to Timothy was was saying that this is something that pleases our Lord and Savior that we pray for everyone it is good it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved There's some in the church I don't believe are convinced by the word all need to be all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth including people that we would think were beyond the pale that there was no possible hope for them because of things that they have done maybe crimes that they have committed people that you might think there is no way they would ever respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ the thief on the cross did And I want to talk about some of those people that maybe we would have written off. Maybe we would not have given any consideration to the possibility that they could ever respond to Jesus because of what they did. Men like Hermann Goering, Rudolf Hess, Joachim von Ribbentrop that you can see here in the docks at Nuremberg in Germany between November 1945 and October 1946, the Nuremberg trials. Men who were tried by this international tribunal that was set up to judge these men for their crimes against humanity and specifically their crimes against the Jewish people. Have any men been responsible for more heinous acts of cruelty and brutality than men like this well I want to highlight one of those men Joachim von Ribbentrop here he is von Ribbentrop was a devoted follower of Adolf Hitler and he was a vociferous anti-semite he hated the Jews as ambassador to Britain in 1937 he famously or infamously greeted King George VI with a Heil Hitler salute. He was appointed by Hitler as Reich Minister for Foreign Affairs, greatly admired and esteemed by Hitler. And he was the man that signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact between Germany and Russia, Hitler and Stalin, in 1939. Ezekiel 33 verse 11 a prophetic word that was given by God through his servant Ezekiel to the nation of Israel says this as I live declares the Lord God I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked 
but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And we have glorious examples, don't we, in Scripture of the wicked, those that we may have thought there was no possibility of them ever turning to Jesus. Men like King Manasseh, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and as we mentioned before, the thief on the cross. Well, the Lord knew all about Goering and Hess and Ribbentrop. And God so loved men like that that he sent his son Jesus into this world. And during the Nuremberg trials, he sent a pastor to minister to these men, to become the pastor of these men who were being tried. And many of them, in due course, were to be executed, as we know. This is Henry Gericker, a Lutheran. He was a chaplain in the United States Army. And he was appointed to be the chaplain at Nuremberg. How about that for a calling? And not surprisingly, he struggled. He struggled with the thought of where he was going to be sent and who he was going to be asked to minister to. Because he knew what these men had done. But he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus. He was obedient, he submitted to God's will, and he went. He went into that den of iniquity. He went into those cells for 12 months, and he ministered to men like Joachim von Ribbentrop. Arrogant, snobbish, Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop made no attempt to conceal his cool indifference at the sight of the chaplain entering his untidy cell. Strongly anti-Semitic, he considered the Jews a useless breed. This was a hard man to love. I would say this was an impossible man to love without the love of Jesus in his heart. And we can find that, can't we? I can find that in my own life, that there are some people harder to love than others. It shouldn't be like that because Jesus loves all. And that's the need of the hour, isn't it? That we would have more of the compassion, the love, the mercy, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. This was a hard man to love. But as Henry Gerica wrote, time was short. Once judgment day was declared, Gerica was not sure how soon executions would take place. As he gathered his little congregation together each evening, he preached with intensity, praying that God would yet touch further hearts with the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see now a short clip from those Nuremberg trials. Eleven will hang, six will be jailed, three are acquitted. Sir Geoffrey Lawrence pronounces sentence. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Defendant Joachim von Ribbentrop, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you, sentences you to death by hanging. Sentenced to death by hanging for his crimes. And we might want to say, and justly so, because of the lives that he and his colleagues were responsible for. But God had not put the full stop at the end of his sentence on Joachim von Ribbentrop's life. There he is in his cell, a changed man. For nearly a year, Henry Gerica writes, von Ribbentrop had heard the chaplain proclaim, or the author that's talking about Gerica, had heard the chaplain proclaim Jesus as the answer. The cross, the power of the blood of Jesus, that by grace are ye saved through faith. Ribbentrop could hold out no longer, seeking God's forgiveness and opening his heart to Christ. I don't know anything about Henry Gerica's eschatology. I don't know where he stood on the rapture. 
But I know that this man walked closely with the Lord Jesus because you could not minister God's grace and God's love to such as Ribbentrop without that in your heart. And Gerica was driven by an urgency. Judgment day was short. He had to proclaim, he had to pray while there was yet time. Well, hallelujah for the life of uh, Ribbentrop at the end, that that life was placed into the hands of Jesus Christ. But this man went to the gallows. He was second behind Hermann Goering. And as we know, Goering committed suicide in his cell. And so Ribbentrop was first to go to the gallows. And he didn't kick and scream. He didn't object. He went to his death, to his execution. But let's listen to this clip again from the Nuremberg trials. This is what awaits Goering, Keitel, Rosenberg, and the other apostles of death and hate. The only conceivable end for these merchants of aggression. The only conceivable end for these merchants of aggression. That's how far the mind of man or the mind of the judges at Nuremberg could go with such as Ribbentrop. But it wasn't God's end for this man. And Gerica, Pastor Gerica, knelt and prayed with Ribbentrop in his cell. I think they broke bread together and then to the gallows. And these are Gerica's words. And then he, Ribbentrop, turned to me and said, and my heart still warms when I think of it, I'll see you again. Amen. What a testimony to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, to his compassion and his love. What an encouragement to you and I not to give up on any man, woman, whatever they have done, because Jesus is still seeking and saving the lost. As we read in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slow, slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all, all should reach repentance. We know all will not reach repentance, but yet that is our Lord's desire. So my two sources, main sources for that information, Frederick Grossmith's book, The Cross and the Swastika, and then Don Stevens' book, War and Grace. A word of encouragement as we draw to a close. The title of this paper is The Rapture and Evangelism. But as we read in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, the Lord Jesus gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Not everybody is called to be an evangelist. I am not an evangelist. Some of you are evangelists and the Lord has used you to bring many to faith in Jesus Christ. That is a special and high calling, a special gifting from the Holy Spirit. But not all of us are called to be evangelists. Not all of us are called to go out into the fields or onto the streets and engage in evangelistic crusades. Not all of us have that gifting. I don't have that gifting. But Jesus said, Acts 1 verse 8, you will be my witnesses, martores. Not my evangelists, but you will be, all of you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And that is an encouragement to me. That is an encouragement to us all. Number one, that we're all called to be witnesses. To go out there and speak of Jesus. To go out there and represent Jesus to the lost. Maybe not all called to go out and evangelize with that special gifting, but all called to be witnesses. However weak and feeble we may be, we may trip, trip over our tongues. We may blush with embarrassment. We may not know what to say at times. But it's been a witness, a representative of the truth that we have come to know in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if we have more of his compassion, more of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, then we'll go out there and we'll just tell people and show people all about Jesus Christ. I recently returned from Nigeria had the privilege of speaking in a Bible college and a few churches. And on this particular Sunday morning, I was at a church called the Miracle Center. 
in Benin City in the south of Nigeria. And that morning I was going to preach about the parable of the wedding banquet and the urgency, the lateness of the hour. And the church didn't know what my message was going to be. But before I got up to speak, the youth group put on a, a sketch. And it was all about the lateness of the hour. And this man was just depicting the Christian that knew that Jesus was coming back. The Christian that had a, a desire to tell his friends that time was short and they needed to turn to Jesus so that they would not be left behind when he came. They would not face the, God, the wrath of God that was coming upon the earth. And so this young man holding the clock just a, a couple of minutes to midnight, he was running around speaking to his friends, but they were too busy with their college work and their university degrees. He was running around speaking to his friends that were too busy in worldly pursuits. He was appealing to those who were too busy in the workplace, pursuing their careers as many are today, pleading with them to turn to Jesus because the hour was late. And then in that sketch, the trumpet sounded and it was too late for those that it had ignored his message. Well, Samuel and myself, we flew out to Dallas via Chicago on Friday morning on American Airlines Flight 55. And it was a very comfortable flight. And we always fly with American Airlines. And we're very grateful to the Lord for bringing us safely here. And we trust that he will take us safely home on Thursday morning when we depart. But I want to close by, I'll close this part of the presentation by speaking of an American airline pilot that I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard about. And his name is Steve Scheibner. He was the pilot of, or he was due to be the pilot of American Airlines Flight 11 on September the 11th, 2001, flying from Boston to Los Angeles. He'd made that flight many times. He was qualified to take his place as a pilot on that flight. And he had put his name forward and it was registered on the computers with American Airlines. As far as he knew, he was going to be the pilot and he was just waiting for the call on September the 10th to confirm that he would fly American Airlines Flight 11 the following day, but the phone call never came because somebody else took his place. I don't know anything else about Steve Scheibner. I don't know about his eschatology, but I do know that there was an urgency that the Lord put into this man's heart because of what, well, what he didn't go through, where he wasn't, but was due to be on September the 11th. And I'm just going to play a, a couple of minutes of his testimony that I pray will encourage us and, and stir our hearts. 20 years ago, I wrote a life objective. And my life objective goes like this. It's to seek, trust, and glorify God through humble service and continual prayer to raise up qualified disciples as quickly as possible so that someday I might hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. The events of September 11th took that life objective that I already had and it intensified it for me. The fire just keeps getting hotter as I get older. But someday I want to stand in the Lord's presence and I want him to say, well done. I would hate to get in God's presence and have him say, oh, yeah, Scheibner, I see your name's down here. Well, you know, have a seat. I need to hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what's on my plate, and that's what's driving me these days. Um, why does God take one and, and leave another? It's not because um, I'm a better person or, or God wanted to do more with me than he wanted to with Tom. I, I think in God's providence, uh, that's obviously his choice. What has stuck with me all these years is the fact that he did leave me behind, is that I need to act like I'm living on borrowed time 
because I am. I can look and see my smoking hole, and it was on national TV. And I saw where I should have died, but I didn't. And now there's an obligation that comes with that. I've got to live my days with a sense of urgency. I have to make sure I get the most out of them, and not the most for me. That's, I think we, we live in a world where everybody's kind of out to get the most for them. This is not about me. This is about the distinct privilege I've been given to know that somebody died in my place. What I know is that somebody died in my place not once, but twice. That's where God comes into the whole thing for me. See, Tom sat in a seat that I was qualified to sit in. And, if, and by all rights, I, that was my seat that day. I should have been in that seat. In fact, I've sat in the very seat of that airplane that Tom was in. I've flown all of the, the 757s and 767s American Airlines own. So I know what it's like literally to sit in that seat. But I am still, all these years later, still qualified to sit in that seat. And I could have. But Tom didn't die for my sins. You see, God sent his own son to die for my sins. Jesus Christ was the other one who died in my place and he hung and he bled and he suffered on a cross to pay a price for me that I wasn't qualified to pay. I couldn't have hung on the cross. I didn't have the same qualifications. So one guy sat in a seat that I should have sat in, the other hung and bled on a cross. One is far more significant than the other. That's not to trivialize what happened to Tom. It's to elevate um, and glorify what God did for me and you know, for mankind on the cross. responsibility don't we with the message that God has revealed to us through his word concerning the coming of the Lord and that urgency that's why I played this clip the urgency and realizing time is so short and the need that we have to do everything that we can to to tell others about Jesus the one who died in our place a very little while and he will come only a brief season can remain for us all. But what may not be done in these quickly passing days? The words of Pastor John Harper, who I mentioned a couple of years ago, his life was not spared. He went down on the Titanic. But you remember what he did in his final moments. He went to everyone that he could, crying out, is your soul saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, I was sent this little poem and I'll read it to you now from Sweden. Today, perhaps, perhaps today, yes, he may come, then watch and pray. This blessed hope keep much in view, nor deem it dead, though taught by few. And be as urgent as we may in winning souls while tis today. Even so, come Lord Jesus, and I know that is the cry of our hearts. And this presentation has been a little bit um, different than uh, maybe you were expecting, but I wanted, felt in the Lord that the focus should be upon Jesus and upon the cross. And as I've done in previous years, I brought with me to Dallas a song that my pastor Andrew Robinson has written not especially for the pre-trib conference, but something that the Lord put on his heart and something that we felt together would be very much appropriate for the conference, for the message. Uh, a song that we pray once again this year will be a blessing and an encouragement to each one. It's a song that was inspired by a poem written by a dear lady that went to be with the Lord last year called Win Riley somebody much loved by Samuel and his parents, much loved by our fellowship. She loved the Lord, she knew Jesus was coming and she was ready. And she told as many as she could 
while she had time. And so that poem inspired uh, Pastor Andrew to write this song. It's called, I Come Before the Cross of Christ. And with that, I finish the presentation.
Thank you, Paul, for that gift from Across the Sea. Another excellent song to end your presentation. We have a few minutes here for question and answer. So does anybody have any questions? I don't think we'll find any debate from this presentation. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, it's always an excellent presentation from you. What bearing did you see in your studies about the 1859 revival and some of the other related revivals that you had, of course, in the United Kingdom and here in America related to the rapture? What, sorry, I didn't quite catch the beginning of that. What, what bearing? Well, the, the famous 1859 revival. Yeah. It's called the Layman's Prayer Revival in New York City. New York City? Yeah. And then on into the Civil War you had in the South. I read in, um, what's his name, the history of British evangelicalism, that simultaneously all around the world in March and April of like 1857 or something like that, revival broke out in Germany and Sweden and the UK and Ireland and, and the United States all within a month. Yeah, and these, one, uh, these wonderful... They were independent. Some writers have written that one affected the other, but they were actually independent. And England was the biggest at the time. Yeah, and it was a huge... That could include the Welsh Revival, I don't know, but uh, that was a huge, obviously, work of the Holy Spirit that can't mm. be explained any other way. Mm. In Ireland, 1859, incredible revival there. Yeah, whenever... The, Whenever there are evangelical revivals, what happens is that those who are saved or those in the church that become more serious in following the, the Lord turn back to the Word of God. That's what happened with the evangelical awakening in this, the 18th century, that men went back to the Bible and re, um, just regained that, that, that sense of imminency and urgency, whether they all understood the rapture in the way that we uh, do today well no they didn't all have their eschatology clearly mapped out uh, for many of them that wasn't their focus their focus was to to reach the lost with the, the good news of Jesus Christ but that's why I tried to show in the first part of the presentation that many of these men were a millennial but they were looking for Jesus to come you know they had their their focus on the Lord and I think that's what's often happened during times of revival true genuine revival is that people the Lord puts the Word of God back into their hearts and a love for Jesus that just drove them drove them out to to uh, seek and save the lost I just want to know if you think you're gonna get back to Manchester on American Airlines <laughs> yeah we always travel with American wherever we can <clears throat> that bankrupt airline Oh yeah, yeah, I heard about that just before we came out here. Well, we trust the Lord. If he, if he wants us back in Manchester, then... In we'll, fact, uh, I just recently heard only Southwest Airlines is the only American airline that hasn't gone bankrupt <coughs> at one time or another. Wow. You know, we flew on uh, Southwest. It's just wonderful here to hear about the history of awakenings in, in England. You hear about the bad things in England and the rise of Islam and so forth. Are, do you see any seeds or, or any signs of spiritual awakening in England at all? No. <laughs> no. Um, you know, we, we see, of course, we, we're seeing people come to faith in the Lord, but it is very hard. The mission field in the West sure it's the same in this country as in the UK it is very very hard just to be able to talk have a conversation with somebody about Jesus it is so hard because they just think you're you're off your trolley you know you're out there um, so no we're not expecting some great nationwide revival um, you know our, our main focus is on encouraging the Saints and teaching the church because the church in the UK largely has lost this doctrine and there are many churches many organizations that are very pro-Israel which is wonderful but they're not looking they're not the focus isn't on Jesus 
It's not on the rapture. It's not on our blessed hope. And you've got to have in that order. The coming of the Lord for his bride, the church, and Israel, will, the burden for Israel will come forth from that. And many in the church have got things the wrong way around. Right. So a large part of our ministry is just trying to proclaim the any moment coming of, of the Lord Jesus and the need to be ready, to be detached from this world, and the need, the urgency, the responsibility we have with this message to go out and be witnesses for Jesus. But no, it's getting darker and darker. I think if things were getting brighter and brighter, we would be questioning the Word of God um, because that tells us things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse before Jesus returns. But yeah, it's a, a nation now of compromise, of liberalism, um, of religious toleration to the point where you can't raise any criticism of any religion. Um, let, me, let me just say, when I was there for 27 days with Paul, most of the people that were at the conference were older people. Mm. And uh, the only younger people I saw were from Oxford, interestingly enough. Now that's just what I saw when I was there for 27 days. And they seem to be very excited about these things, a group at Oxford of all places. Yeah, there, there are a group, but sadly, group. we've imported the emerging church. And that's where a lot of our young people are going. They're going into the experience. They're going into, you know, the, the prayer labyrinths and, you know, all this social gospel. And they want the experience. They want the candles. They want the incense. They want the music. They want the, the, the tingly sensations down the spine. But in the main, they don't want the Word of God. And that's, that's so sad that there's been such an infiltration in, in our church. But it's interesting, in the 19th century, in you know, the 1800s, uh, it was a, probably the second greatest time of British Christianity next to the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And it was because of the, the Bible movement that was related to uh, the Second Coming. And even in the Anglican Church, it's estimated in the middle of the 1800s that over 50% of Anglican ministers were premillennial. Now, they weren't pre-trib necessarily. Uh, and J.C. Ryle would be one example where he wrote the premillennial creed. Charles mm -hmm. Spurgeon signed that. And uh, you had uh, a tremendous vibrancy of the Bible teaching movement uh, and, it, and the brethren just boomed back then because they were teaching the rapture and, the, yeah. and, and it was a Bible study movement and people were excited about the second coming. And of course, yeah. the same thing is happening in the United States. Our movement came out of a Bible conference, Bible study movement, mm -hmm. and we are in decline, you know, probably for the same reasons that England has declined. Yeah, and we were talking about revivals, but the early Pentecostals, for a lot of the excess that took place in the early 20th century, most or many of the early Pentecostal pioneers were dispensationalists. They were looking for the coming of the Lord, you know, because that was the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So it was the, the Bible and the work of the Holy Spirit that really just drove that 20th century missionary movement but yeah it was it begins with getting back to the Word of God and seeking the Lord well and even most of the pastors that I met were what we would call bivocational pastors you know uh, there are very few in the UK that have any kind of training because I'm sure it's embarrassing to go to the university and believe in the rapture right mm. very embarrassing and so many of the churches that do hold our views you know uh, have uh, pa uh, pastors that did something else and then many of them are retired and they're uh, leading a flock or something like that mm -hmm. today. Excellent presentation. It's been said in the last 20 or 30 years more Jews and more Muslims have come to Christ than at any time in the last 2,000 years. 70% uh, of all evangelism that's ever been done has been done since 1900, 75% of that since World War II, 70% of that in the last 36 months in 1994 from the National Light for the Lost Director for the Assemblies of God. It's been said that uh, the church has grown from China, in China, from a million members in 1970 to some estimates are as much as 100 million today. Is it scriptural? 
we believe to see a significant move of God in the last days short of conversion of the whole world. Yeah, I mean, there's only one nation that's promised a national revival, as I understand the scriptures, and that is Israel. But the Lord, you know, one of the most glorious passages in scripture is Revelation 7, in the tribulation, when John is shown that great multitude from all tribes and tongues and, and peoples, and uh, he doesn't recognize who they are. That's how I would read it. And he's told these are they that are coming out of the great tribulation a multitude beyond number and that just speaks and that's one of the things I wanted to bring out through the presentation it just speaks of God's grace that there is an urgency in the heart of the Lord if we have one of the sermons I think it was Richard Sibbs the title of one of the sermons was the church's echo and he was talking about how in the heart of the church in the heart of the believer must echo what is in the heart of the spirit the heart of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the Bride, say, come, in Revelation 22. Yeah, I wanted Arnold to comment on the Jewish evangelism since he is well aware of those issues. There's been a, there was a Jewish revival actually primarily in East Europe about the 1880s until um, somewhere between the First and Second World War. We had many rabbis coming to faith. We know at least two whole synagogues that came to faith and there were large messianic uh, churches, as they called them back then, uh, in uh, Poland, in Lithuania, in Latvia, in Russia, and so on. And um, so they um, didn't penetrate the American Jewish scene or the Canadian Jewish scene and elsewhere, but they penetrated uh, East Europe. And um, uh, unfortunately, it didn't survive the Holocaust, and the vast, vast numbers of the messianic Jewish people at that point were killed during the Holocaust. Um, I don't know where they got the uh, figures from, but there was an estimate done by the then Hebrew Christian Alliance, uh, International Hebrew Christian Alliance based in England, and they estimated of the six million, about two and a half, 250,000 were Jewish believers in Jesus that perished. Also in the Treblinka revolt, one of the leaders of that revolt was a Jewish believer. He didn't uh, survive the revolt, but the people who knew him, not believers in Jesus, all testified that he was a believer in Jesus. He was still loyal to his Jewish identity and was one of the leaders of the Trumplink Revolt. But we saw a massive revival among Jews here in North America in the 1960s and 70s, but we did not see rabbis coming to Lord in any great numbers, no synagogue came to Lord and so on. And so the East European revival in that period of time was very, very unique. Yes, yeah, my, uh, my pastor always teaches us the Holy Spirit represents or represents the Lord Jesus. And if the Lord Jesus was urgent in his ministry on this earth to, to seek and save as many before the judgment would befall Jerusalem, then how much more is the Holy Spirit trying to bring that urgency into the church to, to be uh, a light, to be witnessing while there's time? And the Lord wants people saved. He loves the lost. And so we should expect to read about revivals in parts of the world. Thank you, Paul. Uh, appreciate that wonderful presentation. Okay, our next presentation is uh, Dr. Tim Demme. Uh, 